Oh, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm happy to be here today. In this presentation, I'll be sharing the topic I presented at this year's Design Con on dielectric anisotropy. I hope you find it useful. As my friend, Dr. Eric Bogdan likes to say, there are two kinds of engineers, those who have signal integrity problems and those who will. And as a corollary to that, I would like to say, there are two kinds of engineers, those who do not have impedance problems and those who will. Using correct dielectric material properties is crucial for accurate modeling. And one of the most important parameters is EK. So using incorrect EK values can affect the PCB fabrication yield or reduce the performance margins of your design. In the process of designing a PCB stack up, it's important to get accurate dielectric material properties from reliable sources. One of the most important parameters is DK. For a typical differential pair strip line structure, there are generally three different layers of dielectric. There's the core layer, the prepreg layer, and resin layer between the traces, and often all have different DK values. So you'll need to get the right numbers for accurate impedance modeling. And the typical PCB fabrication process is quite a complicated affair. And every step along the way, the cost increases. So by the time you reach step 19 here, electrical tested impedance checking, you wanna make sure that your design is uh, correct. Otherwise, you'll get a call from your fabricator saying your impedance failed. What do you want us to do about it? So what's going on here? So here's what we'll learn today. I'll start off talking about TDR impedance test issues. I'll go into laminate construction and PCB material properties and give an overview of that. I'll explain anisotropy. I'll discuss popular DKDF test methods. And I'll talk about transmission line B impedance and RF antenna implications due to anisotropy. And finally, I'll give an example of dielectric anisotropic valid uh, issues. So some reasons for today's TDR test failures include IPC TM650 2.5.5.57 test method. Uh, that manual is dated. The last update was back in 2004, which is 20 years ago. So back then we were dealing with wider traces, thicker copper, higher DKDF and looser tolerances. Fast forward 20 years, we're now having narrower traces, thinner copper, lower DKDF and tighter tolerances. Back in 2004, typical TDR shown in red, uh, would be typically flat due to the geometries of the day. Uh, today, with the narrow line widths and uh, lower DKDFs, uh, we see a slow monotonic rise, or steeper that it used to be uh, in, uh, compared to 20, 2004. Also, some DKDF test methods affects your impedance uh, calculations. Uh, and those test methods find their way into the DKDF construction tables. And those construction tables are used to do your impedance uh, calculations. So in this example, if we used an in-plane measurement, which I'll be discussing the differences later, and you center your design shown in the red curve with plus minus 10% tolerance. But if, uh, you know, the actual decay we need is out of plane. And when you actually measure it, um, it's actually moved up, the impedance is higher. So you've lost effectively a positive margin on your design by using the uh, wrong decay value. Another issue is um, we do our stack up design. We generally use a 2D field solver but a 2D field solver is a lossless calculation for impedance. In reality, uh, when we do the TDR measurements, a lossy measurement. 
uh, for the length of the trace. And the actual impedance is near the beginning of the TDR plot. And the effect of the uh, IPC standard, we typically measure 30 to 70 percent along that uh, the TDR line. So if you have a steeper slope, you have more potential of failing. And if you use the wrong BK, uh, it erodes that margin even further, as we see. So before we continue, I'll give an overview of the copper clad laminate manufacturing process, just to bring things into context for the rest of the presentation. So if we start off with the raw materials of uh, the, uh, fiberglass yarns, they're woven into fiberglass cloth, much like they do in the textile industry, using a weaving loom. And they have uh, warp yarns and weft yarns. The warp runs the length uh, of, the, of the cloth, and the weft is the uh, weave pattern in between, going horizontal. Then there's uh, the resin that uh, is used um, with it. And there's many different uh, kinds of resin used today, from epoxy to proprietary blends. Um, the glass fiber cloth that get, then gets impregnated with uh, the resin called the A stage. And it goes through a drying process and the sheets are sheared off in uh, sizable sheets. And you end up with a finished prepray called the B stage. And that's semi-cured uh, prepray. Then there's the copper foil. There's two different types used in the industry. There's rolled copper and electric deposited copper. Now, the rolled copper tends to be smoother uh, and more expensive compared to the ED copper. Uh, then the copper gets, uh, sheets of copper gets put on each side of the pre-break sheets and under heat and pressure, uh, you end up with the finished laminate. Here's some examples of common standard woven glass styles um, from uh, Isola. And you can see there's uh, the weave pattern is different for each uh, style, glass style number. And each number is unique. And they're documented in the IPC 4412A document. And that's a useful document that describes each glass style cloth, uh, the warp and the field dimensions, uh, the weight, and that, many other things. And here's an example of uh, DKDF resin properties. Um, 20 years ago, typically this list was shorter. Uh, we had mostly was epoxy based. There were higher loss and standard loss things of, you know, a range between 3.6 and 5. In DF range, you know, 0.015 to uh, 0.02 type of thing. Uh, fast forward to today, we have uh, all the way up to proprietary blends where DKs have been lowered down to two to three and, and the DF is an order of magnitude uh, smaller, typically. Then there's the uh, glass styles that, uh, or the glass that's used uh, for years. The most popular is the e-glass uh, for, the, for the fiberglass. Uh, the yarns, and that typically had a DK of seven or seven. And uh, but today, with the higher speeds, uh, the lower loss materials, uh, we see laminate suppliers moving to the L glass, which has a lower DK and DF um, for those laminates. So all glass reinforced laminates are anisotropic. So if we imagine a block of, uh, of, uh, of, of the core laminate without the copper showing the weave pattern that's in there, and we put uh, copper sheets above and below and apply a DC potential to it, we see that the electric fields are going perpendicular to the actual weave that's uh, in, the, in, the, in the laminate block. If we move the plates to the end along the X direction, um, we see the E fields moving that way. And we denote that as DKX, basically. And if we move it the other way in the Y direction, we denote it as DK, DKY. Um, so 
DKX and DKY, we approximate them to be the same. So we just denote it as DKXY. So we use the rule of solid mixtures. We can predict what the decay is of the mixture of glass and resin. So if we have a block of uh, resin and a block of glass with the decays shown here, and we apply the DC potential, we see the E fields uh, going in that direction. Uh, essentially, the, uh, the mixture of the, the glass, the uh, the capacitance of each block, they're in series. So we'll use this parallel mixing rule equation at the bottom, uh, DKZ. And if we move the plates to the end, now the E fields are going uh, in the X, Y or X direction. And the actual capacitance of the two blocks now are in parallel. So uh, then we'll use for DKXY the series mixing rule as shown in the bottom equation there. And we calculate anisotropy as the DKXY uh, over DKZ, basically. And with these volume resin mixtures and DK uh, the glass, we end up with the anisotropy of 23%. Here I'm plotting the anisotropy versus glass resin mixture. And using the DK 6.8 and DK resin of 2.5, for the previous example, we see that at 50% uh, resin content, that maximum anisotropy is 27%. Now, if we keep everything the same, except just change the decay of the glass, for instance, we see at 50%, the uh, maximum has reduced uh, over half uh, to 11%. So what this says is the closer the DK resin to DK glass match, the lower the anisotropic effect. So here's some popular dielectric constant test methods used in the industry today. Uh, to start off with is the uh, clamp strip line resonator test method, uh, TM650 2.5.5.5 Rev C. And that is an out of plane measurement. So the DK, results you get are uh, what we call DKZ. Similarly, there's the Bereskin strip line resonator, um, and that will give you an out-of-plane DKZ value as well. Uh, another a test method that's uh, been approved by the IEC the European standard is the balance type circular disc resonator. And uh, when you use that, the DK is the DKZ. Similar to that to is the split cylinder resonator. It's TM652.5.5.13. But unlike the uh, balance type circular resonator above, uh, it's an in-plane uh, measurement. In other words, you get DKXY results out of it. And similar to that is the split post dielectric resonator. Uh, some people call it split post cavity. And that too is a, a DKXY measurement. Here's a nice uh, animation from my friend Giuliano Mulgani from ANSYS, uh, showing the electric fields uh, at 20 gigahertz, uh, propagating along a, a microstrip structure starting at the top left moving along in the microstrip till it hits the via and propagating down the via to layer three and, and along layer three and propagating down through the stub. And the important message here you see is how the electric fields, uh, the direction changes depending on how it goes through the via. Uh, in the one case, the DKZ perpendicular, um, you know, through the channel there and uh, going through the via it's uh, in plane with the actual uh, um, uh, weave structure. So the implication is, is if you use DKZ, um, you, you get the right trace impedance, but if uh, you get the wrong uh, in trace impedance if the DK was DKXY. 
And similarly, if you use DKXY, the FE impedance and stub resonance will be right. Uh, but DKZ, if you use, you'll get the wrong V impedance and stub resonance. So the message is here really uh, depending on uh, the wave propagation through the, your system, there's really two different DKs that uh, are needed for the modeling. So here's the implication for transmission line modeling. If uh, we started off, if we use the DKXY from uh, this uh, split post or cavity resonator, um, you know, did our design that way, we end up with, you know, design for 100 ohms. We plot it out. Uh, things look, this is a TDR of this geometry. But in reality, it's, uh, you know, the DKZ, you end up with uh, a higher impedance uh, if you use that number. Mm -hmm. And if you started off with DKXY and you measured, it had 23% on isotropy, you see our impedance would be uh, way out of spec here. It's an, ex an extreme case. And here's the similar anis anisotropic implication for antenna modeling. Um, if we used the DKXY for this model and tuned it uh, as shown in red, uh, but when you built it or actually used the other DK, uh, you see that there's a shift um, in the resonant null uh, up with an anisotropy of 23% of the material. So your, your antenna uh, design could be out of spec if you use the wrong DK. And here's uh, an example with uh, implications for via modeling. So here's a 3D model done in Keysight uh, ADS. Um, it's basically a 26 mil pitch differential via structure. Uh, you'd find it in a lot of designs. Uh, here's the model with a 10 mil via stub. And I'm doing an example with using a DK of 3.09 and a DKXY of 3.79. So again, using the same 23% anisotropic uh, properties as I've used before. Uh, so all we do is just change the DK and we save the uh, results in a uh, touchstone file and we bring it into the circuit simulator so we can do some analysis and we can plot the uh, insertion loss and return loss of the two. And we can see that at uh, 26 gigahertz, we're about uh, 0.3 dB delta. And at 56 gigahertz, we're at 0.9 dB. And the important of 26 and 56 gig is, 26 gig is the Nyquist frequency for 112 gig systems. And 56 gig is uh, the Nyquist for 224 gig. So you can see as we're moving up uh, the next generations, we can see the effect on the loss of, of just the via itself. And then we look at the TDR plots. Uh, if we've optimized, for instance, using DKZ, uh, which is the wrong DK for vias, uh, we optimize best we could for that. But the real DK we want to use is 3.79. So there's about an 8 ohm difference uh, between the two. So the implications is when you actually go to build your channel. So and a chip to chip to chip uh, uh, topology, uh, for instance, a very short channel, reflections uh, are quite a concern at these higher baud rates. So just do a simple uh, two inch long uh, connection between chips representative. And we model the transmission line uh, as shown and we just used our uh, via models that we talked about earlier in the, in the comparison here. So if we use a single DK, like for instance, DKZ for the via and the transmission line for the whole channel, uh, this is the TDR of the plot we would get. And if we run a COM, which is channel operating margin, uh, that's a relatively new standard that we're using now for these higher uh, bit rates at 56 gig and above. Um, you can see here that uh, this channel would pass, basically, after you run the COM. 
But now if we do the case where we switch the via impedance or via DK, uh, what it should be 3.79, but left the transmission line as it was, that's the correct DK to use. All of a sudden now uh, with this anisotropic of 23%, now we fail. And uh, we fail the effective return loss part of the spec. Um, and also we fail, we lost margin on the actual comm and the uh, detector error rate has gone down as well. So this is the implication of uh, if you're modeling, if you use the wrong DK, for instance, uh, what you'd end up with. So another issue I wanna highlight is um, the issue with EDA tools and net extraction for the signal integrity analysis. Many of the, uh, the buzzword now is shift left with in the industry. All these EDA vendors are promoting their tool, uh, suggesting that uh, you can move the signal integrity process ahead um, and push a button and you get a result. Um, but in reality, as we've seen, we need two different DKs uh, to do it. So but in your design, there's only one DK specified in the stack up in these design tools. So, you know, you can't use just one value. So you really need to be aware uh, if you're going to use the tool, uh, have the ability of uh, changing the DK. So you have to understand the tool and what it's giving you and the limitations. Uh, for it. So this is the uh, title of the presentation that I did at uh, DesignCon. It's a heuristic approach to assess anisotropic properties of glass reinforced PCB substrates. Uh, so what are heuristics anyway? Well, they're metal shortcuts, rules of thumb, or problem solving techniques that help people make decisions and solve problems quickly and efficiently. They do not guarantee absolute accuracy or completeness, and they're based on past experiences and allows you to use readily obtainable information to come up with solutions where more exact information is not easily available. So here's a, a, a good example of using heuristics for a EM wave propagation. So we know we can calculate the velocity if we know the speed of light and the decay of the material shown here. But heuristically, we know that in air, a uh, wave propagates at about 12 inches per nanosecond. And for a simple FR4 with decay of a four, for instance, we see it, uh, it's about half, 12 inches for two nanoseconds. So that's a typical heuristic we can use not perfect, but usable in uh, ca calculations. To heuristically determine anisotropy, we start with the construction tables. And in this case, I show a tachyon hydrogen for an example. The first thing we look for is the test method. And uh, here we see it's uh, TM650 2.5.5.5C, which means it's DKZ and it's measured out of plane. So then we know we need to calculate DKXY from the series mixing rule equation. But the problem is the resin content is in weight. We need to be in volume. Plus, we don't know the DK of the resin. And since that uh, information is not always available from the uh, laminate suppliers. So I described in the paper the uh, how I can get the uh, different DK from the uh, DKDF construction tables. So if we start off with uh, with that, here's an example from uh, Tachyon 100G, for instance, um, all the results for the different glass styles. Then we gather the uh, glass fiber properties from, uh, in this case, AGY is, is norm commonly found on the uh, internet. So we can get, uh, L glass and E glass properties um, easily. So I've summarized it here from AGY. Then we use the uh, IPC 4412A that I mentioned earlier, uh, it would, describes all the uh, glass cloth styles. So we use that document as well. And in this case, uh, we'll just uh, go through the 1035 
cost style example. Um, we identify that in the tables, and we can imagine this block, uh, just a, a block of the of the uh, laminate. And if we could uh, separate now the actual resin and the fiberglass cloth and get the volumes of each, uh, it'll help us uh, with this with uh, the calculations. But just separating it, uh, the volume of this cloth as it is now is not accurate because you can see uh, it's woven and it's not a solid uh, piece of glass. So we imagine that we could uh, melt that uh, cloth back to a solid with a certain thickness and a certain volume now. Now we can uh, assume this uh, a square meter block um, of glass and resin and a certain uh, thickness. So we know to get the volume of, of uh, glass, um, if we know the weight of the glass and the area of the glass and the density and the volume of the total, we can get the uh, actual uh, volume of the glass. And uh, so we get the weight of the glass from uh, IPC table shown there. Uh, the area, we use uh, the one square meter area uh, per this example. We can get the density from uh, the glass fiber properties, in this case from AGY. And the volume total is, uh, is the volume of this whole block. And we can expand this equation out uh, as shown here. And now we can get, uh, based on the thickness, we can get, we use the thickness from the DKDF construction table of the resin. Or sorry, of the, of the glass style here, the thickness from there. Uh, then we, that all simplifies down to the simple equation. We know the weight of the glass, the density and the thickness. Um, we can calculate the volume. So then heuristically, we just convert the DKZ to DKXY in this example. So we've seen before, uh, we used the parallel mixing rule um, in this configuration. We use that equation now, first need to determine the DK of the resin based on that equation. We, 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 we uh, rewrite the equation to get the resin. The reason we want that is because uh, laminate suppliers don't provide typically the uh, DK of the resin. That's usually a guarded IP secret that they don't want to disclose. Uh, so heuristically, we can uh, determine the DK of the resin, which we'll need for the conversion. So once we have that, then we just simply use the opposite uh, DKXY um, equation, series mixing rule, to get um, the DKXY based on DKZ. And then going the other way, um, converting DKXY to Z, we start off with the series mixing rule equation. I rearrange it to get the DK of the resin and then use the uh, parallel mixing rule equation to get the DKZ. So that's really all there is to it. So here's just a practical example. Uh, we just used 1035. We summarized all the data um, listed here. The first step is uh, determine the glass volume based on uh, this one glass style in the table. And we see that the glass volume is 23%. Uh, step two, we determine the decay of the resin. Um, we estimate it to be 2.76. Uh, step three is using the series mixing rule now to get the DKXY, and we can see it's 3.23, which is higher, which we expect. DKXY will be higher than uh, DKZ, typically. And then step four, uh, we see that it uh, has an anisotropy of 5.56% uh, for that glass dial in the table. So what I did here is just uh, with a simple spreadsheet. You can work it all out uh, for the whole table, all the glass styles. Uh, DKZ is what was published. 
in dkxy is uh, heuristically converted. And we can calculate the anisotropy for each cross style. And what we can see here is uh, the anisotropy, just because you calculated 5.6% at the first, it's not consistent for all the glass styles. So they'll be different depending on the glass style and resin content. So next we'll uh, show an example to validate uh, how accurate this heuristic method is. So for that, I'll use uh, TUC um, Thundercloud 400G laminate. And from the actual data sheet, we know that uh, they use a split post dielectric resonator. So from that, we know it's in plane or DKXY are the results from it. So for transmission line model, we need DKZ. So to validate the model, uh, have a signatory test coupon that we typically design for characterization work. Um, and here we have a uh, uh, 2X through structure and uh, fixture duct fixture type thing. So we measure the structures, what we want from the uh, vector network analyzer. And uh, we have two different S parameter models uh, from the measurement. Then we take cross section parameters and actually measure the actual thicknesses of the traces and the dielectric thicknesses, uh, what the real geometry is. Uh, we know that uh, the DK will also vary depending on the pressed thicknesses uh, compared to the DKDF tables. So from the cross section parameters, we can adjust the DK accordingly uh, before we do the conversion. That's what I call DK effective uh, with this arrow here. So we do the uh, conversion uh, step that we showed earlier. Uh, then we bring all the data in from the measurement uh, as well as we de-embed the actual measurement into a tool. Um, and this tool I used uh, Symbior uh, to do the uh, comparison. Uh, we save uh, the results in touchstone files for the measurements and the two different uh, DK values to compare. Uh, then we bring it back into ADS simulator, circuit simulator. Uh, we have the actual measurement, the dot, and the model when we use DKZ and the model when we use DKXY. And here are the results. Um, we can see we have excellent correlation if we look at the blue versus the red. Uh, first off, the insertion loss uh, follows it uh, right on and return loss and the uh, phase difference uh, compared to the, uh, if we use the wrong value, TKXY. And when you uh, do everything right, uh, build your design, this is a TDR from the board fabricator, everything will pass. So in summary then, we can say that uh, all glass reinforced laminates are anisotropic. The closer the DK glass and resin mixture, the better the anisotropy. So it's important to understand material properties for accurate modeling and simulation. And using the same DK value for a transmission line via modeling leads to inaccurate results in your whole channel model. Copper clad laminate suppliers should provide both in plane and out of plane DKDF in their construction tables. That would help us a lot. Uh, PCB fabricators need to be aware of the material anisotropy for better stack-up predictions. And of course, using wrong DK values for stack-up design can lead to poor yield due to reduced margin for process variation. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for attending and I'll take any questions now. Thank you so much. Okay, we are now open for the Q&A. Uh, Bert, do you see the couple of questions that you have? Uh, yes, uh, I guess uh, you can hear me, right, Lucy? Yes. Okay, yeah, there's the question is, how can the DK difference be modeled in extraction stack up definitions? Um, so this is the problem with the tools itself. The tools as they are now to do extraction, they just look at the stack up that's uh, that's imported, 
and the stack up will have just a decay value uh, from the layout. And there's no way that I've seen in, in several tools to adjust for anisotropy. There's very few tools that will take that into account. So this is really to highlight the importance of if you're going to do just extraction, you know, it may be good as a ballpark, but if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, you really need to model the vias separately and the transmission lines separately. You can extract the transmission line and the vias separately and then concatenate them together um, for the channel model. And then you get a more accurate uh, result. Uh, hope that answered that one. Uh, what EDA vendors support DKZ versus DKXY? Um, not too many. I, I know for certainly HFSS, if you're doing 3D modeling, they have the capability of uh, adjusting anisotropy in the tool itself. Um, Although I haven't tried it, uh, Symbior has some sort of anisotropy uh, capability when you specify it in, in the Symbior itself. But uh, other than that, I'm not too familiar with any other tools so far that, that do it. Okay, there's another question. Suggest, okay. You suggest laminate suppliers should supply both DK, I'm just reading the question, both DKZ and XY. Would you share your thoughts on which would be the best test method? What range of frequencies you suggest given the test method limitations? Okay. Um, certainly it would be helpful for our signal integrity modeling to have both values from the actual laminate supplier. Uh, then when you're doing your modeling, you need to realize that transmission line modeling need out of plane or DKZ uh, uh, extracted. And if you're doing vias, it needs DKXY. So um, different laminators will supply, you know, different, uh, different numbers as their test method. They do, they do in their data sheets tell which test method they use. But uh, IPC have over 13 different test methods, if I recall right. And, you know, you have to understand how they are. So I summarized in the presentation here, the most popular test methods used by most laminate suppliers. And uh, hopefully from that, you can establish from the DKDF tables, which ones uh, you need to use for your modeling. And if they only provide you one, uh, this heuristic method that I've presented here uh, is not perfect, that's heuristics, but uh, it'll get you a better answer than not, has been my experience. Um, and for frequencies of the test method, well, that what I do my modeling, I typically use the DKDF at the Nyquist frequency of the baud rate. So most high-speed laminate suppliers now give you, um, starting to give you uh, results from, you know, into the 20 gigahertz range, which is good for the 112, 224 gig uh, modeling. But there's not, haven't had a lot of experience at that rates. That's relatively new. So uh, certainly for 64 gig, or sorry, 56 gig, the Nyquist is like 14 gigahertz. So typically the laminate suppliers for the materials had been up, you know, up to 10 to 15 gigahertz uh, providing to DK's DFs. So they've correlated fairly well um, that I've had found anyways. So I see more questions. So is there a way to determine a physical via model to match impedance of the transmission line? Ah, well, that's, uh, I guess, 3D modeling will probably get you there, but uh, I'm going to give a plug to my friend uh, Scott McMorrow from Samtech. He's done 
several presentations on this you know, uh, Beak Speak type uh, webinars. And, you know, he's shown his methodology to do the VIA modeling uh, that he finds and it's fairly successful. So you need actually a good 3D simulator and get your impedance match of your VIA as, uh, as best you can. Okay. Let me see. Is dielectric anisotropy, is there a, is dielectric anisotropy, is there a, for glass resin PCBs? This also extend to materials like silicon or glass for interposers. Well, anytime you have uh, differences in decay, then uh, you know, uh, there will be some anisotropy depending on how the fields travel. So I'm not as familiar with uh, the silicon or glass interposers, but I, if that's just uh, sort of a, there's no mixture of glass and or any other properties. If it's just one solid uh, dielectric, for instance, there shouldn't be um, a, a difference too much if it's more homogeneous type of thing. Okay, now, above what frequencies is it necessary to take into account the different EK values? Um, well, I think you're going to have an anisotropy regardless. So I guess if you're modeling these higher speed channels, like certainly 56 gig and above, certainly 112 and, and above, your margins have uh, shrunk a lot more. And as I've shown a demonstration, just that via of eight ohms difference in a very short channel, the reflections can cause you from passing a compliance to failing a compliance. So I guess that's probably where you have to start paying more attention. This has been my experience now. It's the higher bit rates we're getting to. Um, I think I've answered all the questions on the list. Yeah. I think we no longer have questions. Thank you, Bert, for presenting. It was nice to do this webinar with you. Oh, no, one more question. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go through. I've been away from high-speed design for a while, but I'm back now, was aware, and I sought to be back then. But I was told that it was much worse, say, 100%. Is the 23% or so a newer result due to more? Oh, that's a really good... That's really good, because... Uh, I learned about anisotropy back in 2008, 2009 timeframe when I was studying uh, via modeling at that time. And uh, we came across it when we were trying to relate modeling in HFSS. The student I was working with, he brought it up because initially I thought all about, oh, it was just... Uh, you know, the difference you were getting in the DK was strictly due to the glass itself, but there was more things. But regardless, along that time, I I came across papers by uh, Dankoff. He has done a lot of research uh, in that time frame around 2000. And from his studies back then, he was finding, uh, for the materials we had back then, they were using e-glass. So he was finding that he was seeing anisotropy between uh, 15 to 25% range. So, you know, the examples that I've shown here, you know, with the typical decays of e-glass and the resins, we're showing in around 20, 23%. So that was kind of lining up with Dankoff studies. So it gave me some confidence that, uh, you know, the rule of mixtures probably works out okay. Um, but now if we use the uh, L-glass, which has a lower decay, it's a closer match now to the resin, which for the higher speed stuff is good for us because now, you know, the anisotropy, as we've seen at least with the tachyon, uh, with the L-glass, it was coming down to, you no know, 5-6%, which is not a huge number. 
So, you know, it may not be as bad um, with the higher speed materials, but still, um, this is a way you can determine yourself and do your modeling yourself and see what you need to do uh, when you're doing the high speed analysis and designs.